praise the Lord. But, uh, you know, I did this series many years ago, and uh, I, I just want to refresh it. And there, there's more light and revelation than I have. And this is a truth, honestly, is not often taught in the body of Christ. And a lot of things are, are misunderstood about the, the ways and means of God. And really, even in some circles, they would possibly reject this teaching and, and thinking it's not of faith. Well, if it's in the Bible, it's of faith. We, we have to understand Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, God is always the same. You know, God's ways and means are always the same. Now, there, there are different covenants, but... Um, we're, we're going to look at some things that I, I believe that will answer a lot of questions. A lot of questions of why aren't we experiencing the fullness of God's plan in our lives right now? What, why do sometimes things seem to be so difficult? You know, I, I know what the Word says. I know what God has spoken to my heart, but it certainly doesn't look like that right now. And I believe uh, the things that we'll be teaching on will, will help give clarity uh, to that and understand that life is a journey and there are steps to take to walk in God's highest and best and really a lot of faith teaching you know we, we understand that we can sow and we can give and we can believe God and uh, there's some things that we can see instant results and but there's a whole lot of things that take time it takes growth it takes development it, it, it takes, uh, you know, growing on the inside. It, it takes uh, patience and tribulation in order for us to walk in the fullness of what God has called us to do. And, uh, you know, that's why I've called this the wilderness factor because there many times there's a wilderness involved in it and I want us to see it in a scriptural context. So uh, we always, of course, look to the Word. And so turn with me to Luke chapter 4 and starting with Verse 1. And it reads this, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. Here we read, of course, uh, Jesus was was filled with the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, he, he went to John and got filled with the Holy Ghost, and he said it was to fulfill all righteousness. And here we see that uh, Jesus was led of the Holy Ghost into the wilderness. And why was he led in the Holy Ghost, uh, uh, led of the Holy Ghost in the wilderness? It says very clearly, be tempted of the devil. And just for the sake of time, we're not going to look at the temptations. We can learn how to overcome temptation in our life. But let's pick up after he was through with the temptation. And in verse 14, I'm at 13, Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had ended all temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went on a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So here we, we learn some things. We see some things. We see, of course, first of all, Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. And we know that Jesus wants all of us to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He told all his disciples, don't you depart from Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. But here it talks about that he returned in the power of the Spirit in the Galilee. You know, there's a whole lot of people that are filled with the Spirit of God, but they lack the power of the Holy Ghost. They lack power in their lives. They, they, they lack the victory in their lives. And so we, we see that Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit and he starts to walk in the fullness of what he's called to do. All the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit are now in full operation. He is now making his impact in the world. And uh, we're going to see that this 
is a pattern not only for Jesus, but for all of us. Um, and we got to be careful whenever we, we read concerning the Gospels and ministry of Jesus. Very often, uh, folks make the mistake of, of setting Jesus in a category all by himself. That when we read the Gospels, well, Jesus was the Son of God. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. These are the things that only Jesus can do. Therefore, I just read it as a piece of history. I'm enamored with what the Lord has done and just keep it at that. But we, we have to understand that what Jesus did, he did as a pattern for all of us. That Jesus was the perfect example for us all. Now, we do understand in one sense that Jesus was in a class by himself. I mean, no, he was the Son of God. He was the Messiah. That, uh, you know, we don't need to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Uh, you know, not one of us was born of a virgin. <laughs> Amen. But we have to understand, on the other hand, Jesus was just as human as all of us. And I dare say a lot of people don't have that, that realization in their heart. I mean, they might have in mind, but when you study the Gospels, you have to understand that Jesus was just like you and I. And when I read the Gospels, when I, I, I put myself in the feet of Jesus, and, you know, I wonder how... How can I do that? I have to put myself in, in, in the feet of Jesus and wonder what was going on and, and how to operate like he did because he operated as a man in the Gospels. Now, real quick, just for, this, just for the sake of clarity, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Because we're going to see a pattern of how to get from being filled with the Spirit and to return in the power of the Spirit. Very often, folks are filled with the Holy Ghost and uh, they're endeavoring to claim the promises of God, but they know they're just not where they should be in God. And so we're going to see some things by the example of Jesus and how it applies to all of us. In Philippians chapter 2, uh, in verse 5, it says this, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of servant, was made in likeness of men. And being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself and came obedient to death, even the death of the cross. You know, just reading these verses in the King James Bible uh, can allude uh, a, a precious truth that the Holy Ghost is trying to communicate to us. Uh, in verse 6, it says, Who being the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with a God. And so that, that's a little blind to us. Uh, one translation says this, the, Who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God. And the next verse in the King James said, But he made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of the servant. Now, reading the King James, when we read he, uh, you know, about his reputation, made himself of no reputation, we, we would just kind of assume that Jesus was humble, that Jesus didn't show off. No, even though he was God, you know, he was very humble, you know, he, he had a servant and teachable spirit, and no doubt Jesus had all those things. But uh, there, there's a greater truth here. And again, we're just taking the time to look at this because when we look at the, the life of Jesus, we have to understand he was just like us. And for us to do the works that he did, we're going to have to do them like he did. And understand that he did them not as the son of God, but he did them as the son of man. He did them as a man filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, the word in the Greek to made himself of no reputation, you look that up, it means to empty, to strip, or to make void. Uh, other translations say, but Jesus laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. So it says he, he laid aside his glory, he laid aside his power, his might. Uh, the Weymouth translation said, nay, he stripped himself of his glory 
and took on him the nature of a bondservant by becoming a man. Again, that's so imperative for us to see that he, he laid aside his glory. He became a man. Because a lot of times we think, yeah, yeah, he became a man, but when we operate, he was all God, but not according to the Scriptures. They amplify, says, but he stripped himself, and I like this, of all privileges and rightful dignity. And he became like a man. He was born a human being. So when it said that he made himself of no reputation, that, uh, that he emptied himself, what did he empty himself of? Everything that made him divine. Uh, he was no longer, even though he was God, and we know God has attributes, that God is all-knowing. God is everywhere. God is all-powerful. That's what God, makes God, God. And Jesus, throughout eternity, had all three of those attributes in his life. But when he became a, a, a child, when the Word became flesh, that he put aside, that when Jesus was born, he was no longer all-knowing. I mean, and that is so important to understand. You read the Gospels in this light that you can see yourself in there. How, how did Jesus do that? He had to rely on the Holy Ghost for revelation. He was no longer all-present. He was no longer all-powerful. We know this from Mark chapter 6, that he went to his own hometown and could there do no mighty work. And so Jesus operated and ministered as a man. And, uh, and it's important for us to realize. And the miracles he did, he did as the Son of Man. He did as a man anointed the Holy Ghost. And that's why you read in the Gospels, Jesus did no miracles until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Why? He couldn't do it. He had to be anointed, just like us. We, had to be, we have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to do the works of God. And so he is a perfect example unto us that we can follow. And uh, that's why Jesus said in, in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And see, if he operated as God, we couldn't do the works he did. You know, we, we couldn't be God, but if he was a man... Filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, there's, there's some that claim the lost books of Jesus. And in the lost books of Jesus, they talk when he was a young boy, that he was out playing games with his friends, and one of them hurt his leg, and Jesus would go over and heal them. And, and he, you know, he would do these things. You know, but uh, again, those, those, those books are fake, and it's a lie, because the Bible tells us that uh, he didn't do any miracles until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And his first miracle was what? He turned the water and wine. So even though he was the Son of God for 30 years, he didn't do any miracles until he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He was just dependent upon the Holy Ghost as you and I. And, uh, and if you're called to the ministry, Jesus is your perfect example. You know, uh, if you, you operate in a ministry office and you look, what kind of an example? How, how can I fulfill the office, my call? You look at the ministry of Jesus. We, we don't have time to look at these things, but Jesus was an apostle. The book of Hebrews talks about the apostle and the high priest of our calling. That if you're called in office of pro, uh, uh, apostle, Jesus is your example. Jesus was a prophet. We know this, that he said no prophet is without honor except his own country that uh, he called himself a prophet. He, he operated as a prophet. And if you're called to be a prophet, you can understand and, and learn how to operate in the prophetic office by studying the ministry of Jesus. He is the perfect example. He was an evangelist. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's known me to preach. He was a teacher. We know he went about the cities and, and synagogues and went about teaching. And he, of course, was a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. And so... We have to understand Jesus was the perfect example as a man filled with the Holy Ghost. And so we, we said all that to see this example of how Jesus, even though he was called to, to save us from our sins, he was called into the ministry, 
the progression to how to get from being called to fulfillment. And this is so vitally important. So vitally important for all of us. Even if you're not called, we, we all, God has a plan for all of us. The, the, the Bible says God's plan for you is Ephesians 3.20. He's able to exceed me above all you can ask or think. And so we, we see the progression of that call. No doubt, we, we know Jesus was, was called to die for the sins of the world even from his early age. Um, had the consciousness of that call. We, we don't know if, if Joseph and, and Mary told them about an angel appearing. We, we, we don't know that. I, I don't know. It's not recorded there, but maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But, but Jesus w was aware that he was called probably from the inside. Maybe others ha had told him uh, about that call, about the plan of God. And so all of us, like Jesus, Maybe we sense something about our life. We, we may not know what it is, but there's a destiny, there's a purpose, a plan. And really, I believe every child of God ought to have that. I, I don't believe that any child of God would say, well, I'm just in my life to do this, my own thing. I, I believe what the Bible says that he has a path, he has a plan, he, he, he has a race set before us. We know that in the book of Hebrews. The Bible says, run our race with patience. So there's something on the inside of us that God has placed there to do something in this world for him. Just like Jesus. Again, he, he's our example. Now, when God places that call in you, I believe it, it's like this. It's always in seed form. You know, I, I was a farmer. Now, I, I'm sure some farmers... You, know, you, you can bring them a hundred different seeds and they can point out that seed is this and that. But for most of us, if I hand you a bunch of seeds, they look all the same. You really can't tell what a seed is until it starts to grow, starts leaves and starts fruit. And I believe that's the call on each one of us, the plan of God. We, we just kind of sense something is there. And uh, we really don't know what it is until we walk it out and, and until we see it. And we, we see this progression in the life of Jesus. That, you know, he probably had that call. And remember when he was 12 years old, he began to realize there's something on the inside of me that, you know, I got to be about, what do you say? I got to be about my father's business. And people fail to realize this is that Jesus had to find himself in the word. Jesus had to find out about what he was called to by fellowshipping with God. It wasn't all of a sudden that, man, he was always born with it. He knew what he was going to do from the day he was born. But you read the scriptures, and it tells us, in like Luke 2, 40, you don't need to turn there, that the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. So Jesus had to grow into that plan, grow it spiritually. And even after, when he was 12 years old, and he, he said, his mom and dad says, well, why'd you do this? Why'd you leave us? And he, were he was gone for three days teaching the synagogues. He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? So it began to grow that God had a plan and purpose for his life. But notice what it said even after this, and Jesus increased in wisdom. He increased in favor with God and man. And so he was a man, but yet, the things that were in him had to grow and had to develop them. And he, and he grew into these things. And so at the age of 30, he begins to sense the timing has come for the plan and purpose of God. And we know this, that there is a time factor for all of us. And he goes to John the Baptist. He gets baptized of, of John. He says, this fulfills all righteousness. Then he is gloriously filled with the Holy Ghost. And so naturally you think, man, this is it. He's finally come into his time. He, you know, he's 30 years old. He is recognized as an adult in the, uh, the Jewish faith. Um, you know, he goes and gets baptized in water. And when he comes out of the water, the heavens are opened. And God speaks. You're talking about a prophecy. 
We like it when a prophet prophesies, verily, verily, truly, truly, thus saith the Lord, yea, yea, yea. But this is God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the thing that I want to show you is this. Number one, Jesus was called from birth. Jesus, Jesus had, had the gifts resonating on the inside of him. He had, he had the traits to carry out God's plan. And he, he, he had the prophecy. This is my beloved son. But those things alone did not qualify him for the power of the Spirit. Something had to happen before he can walk in the fullness of that plan. What was that? The Bible says that after God gave him that prophecy, it said this, that he was led of the Spirit into great blessings and prosperity, great meetings, great miracles. Now, most faith teaching, that's what they say. You just name and claim it. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who did not sin, was led of the Spirit, not an evil spirit, was led of the Holy Ghost where? In the wilderness. And the Bible is very clear in the wording. Even though he was filled with the Spirit, he did not return in the power of the Spirit. He was not released in the fullness of what God called him to until he was victorious and overcame the wilderness. This, my brothers and sisters, is still a pattern of promotion today for life and ministry. I bet you're glad you came here tonight. See, really, this is going to answer a lot of questions, especially for young folk. There, there's many things that you, you just know. God's called me to do this, or God wants me to do this, and... and, and and we're wondering, why isn't he here? It should have came already. Well, there's some things that need to be worked out of you. There's some things that you need to overcome in your life before you walk in the fullness that God has called you to. This applies for ministry. This applies for marriage. This, this applies to some places financially. God. What if Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost and received the prophecy and just tried to start ministering? He might have got a few meetings, but God wouldn't have been there. He would have been like Moses with that Egyptian, taking things into his own hands. But he was led to the Spirit. And it's so important Whatever we're called to, whether it's ministry, life, purpose, that we're always led in the Spirit. And sometimes the Spirit of God will lead us into places that may be difficult. And see, if we're not careful, in faith circles, we have this idea if it's difficult, it must not be God. And it's, and it's the very thing that you need to prove yourself, to make you victorious. We, we live in a time, especially with young people, if it's difficult, they don't want to do it. They want to do something else. And that's why they don't have any character. They have no strength. They have no growth. There are some things you'll never learn unless you're victorious in the wilderness. Yeah. You know, some things, if you're called in ministry, well, yeah, I want to heal the sick. I want to cast out devils. You first got to minister your own flesh. And take care of the devil in your own life before you can help others. How do you receive that boldness, that grace, and that strength? It's by overcoming in the wilderness. Yeah. Many are filled, but never overcome the wilderness experience. 
I began to see these things when I was young and when I went to Bible school. You have to understand, when I went to Bible school, I had no gifts, I had no talents, I had no abilities, I could barely put two sentences together that made sense, I didn't like to talk, you know, I, you know other people were so much naturally more talented than I was. And I tell you, that could be intimidating going to Bible school. I saw some that were preachers, and man, they could preach, they were out getting tents, you know, having tent mints on the side, and, and here I am, I can barely put two sentences together. But I watched these people. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. They had talents. They had abilities. They had charisma. And I watched these people over the years. They never, ever really did anything for God. I, I have friends of mine. I, I, I have a friend that, uh, I mean, he was a little bit older than me. I mean, he was good looking. He could sing. He, he could preach. And man, you know... And I'm just me. And man, he, he's going to go far and looked at him. To this day, he's still living with his mother and hasn't done anything in the ministry. And, for, and there's multitudes of people waiting for God to use them in a great and mighty way that they're called to, but they never enter into it because they never went in the wilderness and overcame it successfully. Yeah. Sometimes they, they, they take things into their own hands and try to make their own ministry, their own life, their own way, and God doesn't show up for that. Or sometimes they, they follow the Spirit of God because it's difficult and they give up, or they, do, they fail to, to pass the test of the wilderness. I believe that's why Jesus said, many are called, but what? Few are chosen. Why are they not chosen? They fail to pass the wilderness test. Jesus was our example. The author in the finish of our faith. And a Jesus who did not sin, who was perfect, was led of the Holy Ghost into the wilderness before he returned the power of the Spirit. Do you think we have a little room for improvement in these areas? Do you might think that uh, there's some tests that uh, we need to overcome? Now, when, when I take talk about tests, God doesn't put sickness on you. He, he doesn't put disease. I, I'm, I'm talking going to places where it isn't so comfortable. Being in places where you have to use your faith. Being places where it looks like you're nowhere near what you believe God has called you to, but you stay faithful and you pass the test. Yeah. Again, the Bible says in mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And so Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, following him, his example. But let's look at another example, Israel. We know Israel is a type of the church. That is, God delivered Israel out of Egypt is a type of our deliverance from sin. And when God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he had a plan for them to get them into the promised land. What was in the promised land? A land flowing with milk and honey. That's what we like to confess and believe for. Yes. But between Egypt and the promised land was a little stretch of land. You know what that was called? The wilderness. In order to get from Egypt into the promised land, Israel had to go through the wilderness. Do you see this pattern? From Jesus getting filled with the Holy Ghost before he got into his promised land of great power and influence and ministry, he had to go through the wilderness. Both of them were led by God into the wilderness. All right? God always wants us to lead into our promised land. But before Israel can get there, they had to go through this small stretch of land. Now, I've studied this a little bit. If they were to walk straight through it, it might have just took a couple of days. If they went right from Egypt, straight through it, with as straight as the crow flies, it might just took a day or two. Maybe three days, some folks have said. But God was gracious to them because, because of their 
their, their servant mentality. They didn't want to get too close to, to big cities where there's armies unless they get afraid and want to go back to Egypt. God took them on an 11-day journey to get into the promised land. How many know that that isn't a very long time? That the wilderness was meant to be very temporary. Jesus didn't spend his life in the wilderness. It was just a, a small segment of his life where he overcame. And because he overcame, it affected his life from then on. And same thing with Israel. God was going to deliver them supernaturally. You're just going to go through this short period. We just got to get through this wilderness to get you into that promised land. Short period of time. But what happened? They didn't overcome in the wilderness. They failed the wilderness test. And what happened? They never entered into the promised land. All right. I know this is really exciting. See, today, we just believe we can transport into the promised land. By faith, by confession, by giving. There, there are no shortcuts in some of these things. There are no shortcuts into walking in God's fullness of plan where, well, bless God, I'm just going to believe God. There, there are multitude of Rhema students that are doing that. Years and years, just waiting in Tulsa, waiting, waiting for God to transport them into the ministry. It don't happen that way. you got to be led and follow God, and sometimes He'll put you into difficult positions and just see what you're going to do about it. To overcome your flesh, to overcome your ego, to overcome your pride. Yeah. So, we have Jesus. We have Israel. We can go on. What about Joseph? Joseph was called to great things. He had the sense of a call to, to lead. 17 years old, but he has dreams. God, those are prophecies. You're going to be a ruler, and people are going to bow down to you. That's a call. Now, after Joseph received those prophecies, did he become prime minister of Egypt? No. What happened? He was sold into slavery. If that don't look like he's going backwards... From leadership to slavery. And so what does he do? He's faithful in slavery. He serves Potiphar. Does what he needs to do. He's being faithful. He knows God's called him. I've got to be faithful. God, who either began good work in me will complete in the day of Christ. See, most people would have quit, got angry, got upset, stopped serving God, get mad at his brothers, and say, I quit. And if you quit, you never win. And so, here he's, he's, in doing, he's doing something that looks like nothing that he's called to. It's just the opposite. Instead of being a leader, he, he's a servant. And we know the story. Potiphar's wife gets the hots. And, you know, he, he won't sin against God or, or his boss. And so his wife, you know, he runs away and uh, his wife, Potiphar's wife, falsely accuses him. And what happens? He ends up in prison. He is going further and further away from what appears to be God's plan for his life. And see, what is happening? That's his wilderness test. Where much is given, much is required. See, a lot of folks just want to get there by faith and just believe and confess. There's some things you have to go through in order to pass the test. Jesus did. Israel did. Joseph did. And, and we, we read. Now, 
he's not only a servant, he's in prison, serving the prison. He's helping people. And, and you know, the baker and the butler had a dream. He interpreted dreams. dream. He says, remember me. And, and one died, the one that lived, he forgot about him. All that time, God's looking in his heart. Can I trust you? When it doesn't look like I'm doing anything for you. When it doesn't look like the plan of God is being fulfilled. Are you easy to give up? See, this is why many people don't have power in their lives. They give up. They can't stick to a hard place. If it's not light and easy all the time, they give up on God and, and give into the flesh and, and take things in their own hands. Yeah. And at age 30, we, in one day, he went from the prison to the palace. That's something God did. See, you have to understand, there's only certain things that only God can do for you. But in order for God to do it, you've got to go through God's test. You've got to do it through God's ways. The only way Jesus could come in the fullness of the Spirit is go through the wilderness. The only way Israel could have went into the promised land is through the wilderness. The only way Joseph could have been prime minister is learn the lessons in the wilderness when it was difficult. Ah. Uh, shall we go on? What about Moses? Moses was called from birth to be a deliverer. God did some supernatural things, and, you know, Pharaoh was killing all the young boys, and his, his mom hid him until he couldn't hide him anymore, and put him in a, in, a, in a little raft on the river. I mean, that takes faith. That's a beautiful example. Sometimes you've got to do that with your kids. You've got to let go and let God lead and guide them. And what happens? His sister was watching the raft, and it happens to supernaturally come to Pharaoh's daughter. She opens the crib and has compassion, and she loves a baby. I want him. I want him. All, all young girls want babies, especially when you don't need to give birth to them. This is the easy way. And it, so his sister comes and says, uh, would you want one of the Hebrew women to nurse, nurse the baby for you? And she don't even need to feed it. And it ranges for Moses' mother to feed the child. So God divinely ordering his steps. So when he comes to about 40 years old, you know, he senses that call. No doubt his mom and sister have been speaking in his ears. As a, now bless God, it's time for my time to shine. For me to come on the scene and be the deliverer. And what happens? He starts... He gets a Facebook page, Moses the Deliverer, Instagram, Moses Delivered, and, and business cards, Moses the Deliverer, look at me, I'm the Deliverer, and he, he slays an Egyptian. What is that? He, he tried to make himself something rather than God make him something. See, a lot of the people in ministry are trying to make themselves in the ministry. They're trying to put themselves someplace that only God can put you there. And the only way God puts you there is to pass this test. And notice when, G when Moses struck that Egyptian, you notice God was nowhere to be found. There was no staff in his hand. There was no miracles. There was no signs. God had nothing to do with that type of ambition. When you take things in your own hand, try to make yourself something, God's not to be found. So, Moses is full of Egypt, full of ambition, full of pride. Where did he go to get that out of him? The Bible says he was in the backside of the wilderness. Do, do you happen to see a theme happening here? Jesus, Israel, Joseph, now Moses. And after 40 years of serving sheep, serving his father-in-law, that don't look like what he's called to do. 
God knocks on his door in a flaming fire bush and says, Moses, come here. And uh, he falls on his face and says, now it's time to deliver Israel. Now it's the fullness. You, it's time for you to, to do what I've called you to do. And when Moses says, you sure? Not me. Uh-uh. Are you sure? You someone else. God says, now you're ready. Now I'll get all the glory. See, a lot of things can only be worked out of you through difficulties. The Bible says, the trying of faith worketh patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. What does that mean? That you'd grow up. Oh. Character and faith can only be developed in difficult times. I remember, you know, I, I was called since I was born. I, I knew I was called, you know, ever since as long as I can remember. Then when I got born again, you know, that, that call became so real. And then I, I went to Bible school. And God was very hard on me. I, I, for years, I, I never said this publicly. But much time, he, he was very hard in correcting me, constantly correcting me, and telling me not to do things. I mean, I, I would go somewhere and he'd say, don't go there. He wanted to teach me obedience. He would deal with me about certain things, about appetites and pride, and, and, and I had to keep pulling things down over and over again. And I tell you, I'd be in tears and say, God, you're so hard, you're so nice to everyone else. You're harder than me. Then, you know, after I was done with Bible school, I said, thank God for that's over. And I said, now I'm ready. I'm ready to go win the world. I'm ready to be a, an evangelist. And I had a man of Macedonia experience to come over here to Fredonia. You got to realize when I left Fredonia, I left Forestville, I said, I'll never be back to New York. Never say never to God. And so he brings me... And, you know, I say this kidly. He takes me by the back of my neck and drops me in Fredonia and leaves me for seven and a half years. I remember wasting summers, praying hours a day, Lord, why'd you send me here? I'm supposed to be out doing, being an evangelist. I'm supposed to be out having crusades. I'm supposed to be out doing this. And you send me to, to be in a, a relatively small church and be an associate pastor. Why? He had to work some things out of me. You know, I remember, I, you know, I, I, hear, I go back to, you know, school, and, and folks are saying what they're doing, how big their church is, and, and all this stuff, and I, I just don't, don't ask me. Just don't ask me what I'm doing. I'm cleaning toilets. I'm, you know, because I had a lot of pride, and I didn't know it. I, you know, what other people thought of me was important to me. I wanted to look like I was someone to somebody. God had to work that out of me. The Bible says, He that falls upon this rock shall be broken. On whom this rock shall fall shall be crushed. Will God break you? If you're called to ministry and called to carry the anointing, yes. You've got to understand, you horse lovers... A, spirit, a spirited horse, an unbroken horse, is no use to the master. Can't ride it. He may be full of energy and life, but unless it's broken, it's not useful to the master. Will God break you? If you're called to greatness, He will. You don't hear this in faith teaching, do you? Moses had to be broken. Joseph had to be broken. I was going to write a book about my, my seven and a half years as an associate pastor, but Brother Hagen beat me to it. It's, I went to hell. <laughs> now, there's nothing wrong with the pastors of the church. They're great. I've learned so much from them. But how many know when, when it's continually you're breaking your pride, your, your arrogance, you know, and just went through a lot of humbling things? It's difficult on the mind and the flesh, but I stuck with it. I could not be where I am today 
unless I pass my wilderness test. And it was supernaturally, one day I'm an assistant pastor, and all of a sudden I became a pastor. My ministry and life just, it all started coming together almost overnight. Why? I, I, I passed the test. The problem is too many young people, you quit. Which is difficult. And I'm not just saying young people, but old people too, they quit. It's difficult. I don't like this. They murmur, complain, they give up. I wonder why things don't happen. Because you don't pass the test. How much time do I have? I'm, this is the introduction to my introduction. Jesus, wilderness. Israel, wilderness. Joseph, wilderness. Moses, wilderness. What about David? David was Israel's greatest king. David had a heart after God. David is out, 17 years old, just taking care of his sheep, loving and worshiping the Lord. And I don't know if a servant or the brothers came and says, the prophet of God's in our house and he's calling for you. And he comes in, smelling like sheep. You know, 17-year-old, probably has got pimples all over his face and not fully developed through puberty. And he comes in, and, wow, what, what's going on here? And the prophet God pours his oil and has your next king of Israel. So he's called and anointed. So that day he became king, didn't he? No, not if you know the Bible. For the next 13 years, his life was hell. You know, he had great victories. He slew the bear, lion, slew Goliath. But he had a boss that threw spears at him. You know what most people do? They quit. Or they throw spears back. Yeah. And that's why... They, they never become great. They go from one trouble place to work, another trouble place to work. They don't, you, you, you know, to, to get to 12th grade, you have to pass 11th, 10th, 9th. You have to pass the grades to get into the next thing. And, you know, the children of Israel stayed in the wilderness because they never passed. They murmured, they complained, they gave up, they turned on God whenever things were difficult. But David, David was amazing. He was in a difficult place serving a difficult man who made it very difficult and said, I won't speak against the Lord's anointed. What is it? That's heart school. You have to understand, you may be called and you may have all the talents in the world, but the most important thing is your heart and could God crush you with great thanks. It's only when Joseph proved himself that God could trust him to be prime minister. It was only when God could trust Moses that he could elevate him to be the deliverer. David had to have heart lessons. How, how, how would he respond when things are difficult? Well, tell him how he responds when things are great. Remember when Israel wanted the king. It wasn't the will of God. And so God looked all over Israel. Who, who has the best gifts, talents, and abilities? And he went through all Israel. His name was Saul, son of Kiss. He was the best Israel had to offer. But after two years, he became a corrupt king and a backslidden king. Why? He was never prepared for that position. People that are not prepared for position will eventually be corrupted by that position. That's why you see preachers fall into immorality. They, they fall into sin because they were never prepared. They put themselves in the place that their character couldn't sustain them in it. Heart school.
Remember when David's brothers were being looked at, the prophet of God, and the prophet of God says, man, look at Eliab, the oldest. Man, he's tall, he's good looking, he could lead us into war. He naturally had the gifts and the talents and abilities that we're all looking for. And God said, no, I've rejected him. He said, man, look at that, the outward, the, the charisma, the gifts and the talents. What does the Lord look at? The heart. And you know how the heart is tested? When it's difficult. It's not who you are when things are going well that tells you who you are. It's when things, when things don't look good and all hell's breaking loose. And how you respond, how you act, that tells you where the depth of your character and depth of your strength is. Where your heart is at. See, I didn't understand this. I just thought, man, God hated me going through all this. One thing after another. I didn't realize God was preparing me for a position. And for power that he could trust me with. I don't know if we can take much more. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. See, we don't like that due time. We want to do the drive through thing. But God, God has no drive throughs God didn't have a drive through for Jesus. Didn't have it for Israel. Didn't have it for David. Didn't have it for Moses. And see, this is going to help. Because there's some things that we were to pass a test in. And we just keep rejecting that test. We keep failing that test. And it just seems like we have to keep going around the same mountain over and over again. And we're wondering why we're not getting through that mountain. You have to pass that test. The God's way is call equipment. Then there's a time of preparation in the wilderness where you learn, you grow, and you stay faithful no matter what happens. And he gets you into the promised land. But too many are like one of King David's sons. His name was Absalom. Absalom was everyone's favorite. I have scripture references, but we're not going to turn there for the sake of time because I am fixing, double fixing the clothes. I mean, his hair was so thick, they weighed his hair when he got a haircut. He, all you ladies would love Absalom's hair. When he walked, whoo, Absalom, Absalom, look, he was a hairy man. And he had charisma. And, and, and everyone looked at Absalom. Man, look at the way he walks, the way he talks. And, and he was one of the king's sons. And no doubt was destined for greatness. But he didn't want to do it God's way. He wanted to do his way. And so what he began to do he began to sit at the gates and start to say, man, if I were king, I would do things differently. He began to sow discord, undermine David's leadership. He began to put others down in order to lift himself. What does he do? He's trying to make himself king. He didn't read about Moses when he tried to do it, what happened. And it said this, that Absalom stole the hearts of the people. Passing business cards out, trying, you know, getting many friends on Facebook, you know, that type of thing. There's nothing wrong with friends on Facebook, but that's the idea. He's trying to be liked and trying to make himself a minister, trying to make himself a king, trying to make himself something that, that he wanted. And then he decides to overthrow David, raises up arm, tries to overthrow David. And I love David. I, I never understood this until I grew. When David tried to overthrow him, 
David, David ran from him. David could have slaughtered him on the battlefield. David was undefeated. I mean, he took out Goliath. He could have took out his son. But he ran. And I always thought David was one, but I, I understand it now. That God was the one that brought him the king. God it will be able to sustain this king. See, that, that's why when, you, when, you, when God places you in a place, you're never upset with what other people do. I, 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 I kid, I said, Reverend Scott and all the people I trained from Michigan can split this church. I could care less. Why? God's on my side. And, and it'll be bad for all of them. See, so God never blesses a church split. Never be a part of a church split. Everyone that's part of a church split, they have trouble. Why? They take things into their own hands. Bless God, we'll have a church, a New Testament church. It's the most beautiful thing to, to have the honor of God in place. That's why when Moses, God, he didn't make himself deliver, God did. And when, when people would murmur, complain, he didn't get upset. Well, no, I'm the king. No, me? No, he fell on his face. God, please be merciful to him. He had God backed him up. That is the most awesome place. That's why I don't care. If, if 15 people split my church, I'll be here. God put me here. I have the honor of God. But so many people take things like Absalom in their own hands. And so David runs. What happens? Absalom's killed. The kingdom is restored to David. Why is that in the Bible? To teach us that we cannot make ourselves something only God can make us. There, there is a way, there is a pattern for success, a pattern of being proven before promotion. And this is what we see in the wilderness. Now, that was my introduction. And I said all that just to read this, and this is where we're actually going to start, but not tonight. I think we've had enough. <laughs> huh. You know, the Bible says a man can have nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Alex Haley wrote that great book about roots and miniseries. In his office, he has a, a picture of a turtle on a fence post. And when asked, is, why do you have a picture of a turtle on a fence post? He says, it always reminds me, no matter how great my success is, I didn't get here by myself. See, too many, too many people are trying to climb that fence post as a turtle. And turtles can't climb fence posts. You can't make yourself in a place where God must promote you to. That's what Absalom did. But anyway, this is all cheery. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, All the commandments which I command you this day shall you observe to do that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years. In blessings and prosperity and promotions and every rich thing your hearts can desire. No. These 40 years in the Lord led you in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, to know what was in your heart, that if you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and allowed you to hunger. You know, there's a lot of people don't believe that God will allow you to go through certain things. My, I've experienced, I, I thought God... God didn't love me. You know, God was loving on me. Whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth. Why did my early years, it was like hell. 
God was preparing me for the palace. And here we see here that God allowed them to hunger and fed you with manna, which you knew not, neither your fathers knew, that you might make you to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here God says, it was me that allowed you to go through the wilderness. And he tells us for five reasons. And these reasons are still valid today. What are the five things? Well, he tells us. Number one, to produce humility in you. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Ask Moses. To prove or test you. I can't wait to get to that one. Well, God will never test you or prove you. Have you ever read your Bible? Have you ever read the story of Abraham? Yeah. Three, to know what was in your heart. You don't know what's in your heart to go through a difficult time. God knew what was in Joseph's heart, how he handled Potiphar and how he handled the prison. That's what was in David's heart. God knew what was in David's heart when Saul was throwing spears at him. And the fourth thing is to know your level of obedience. Would you obey God when it looks like God's not helping you? I've never gotten mad at God. You hear people get mad? I've never gotten mad at God. Why? I don't want to fail any test. I've been disappointed in Him, but never mad at Him. And I've done, Lord, I trusted you for that thing. But, but I've always said this, I may not understand it, but I trust you. I, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to entertain why it went that way, but I'm going to go on and keep marching. See, that... That's where victory is won. There's where you get from the, the prison to the palace. Know, know your level of obedience. And fifth thing, to teach you faith. faith. Faith isn't when you have all the money in the world and you feel good all the time and everyone loves you and then you go off and says, man, the blessings of God are mine. I'm a real good faith person. No, faith is like Brother Hagin when he was preaching prosperity and he owed so many people money and he only had a dime and nickel in his pocket and a hole in the other one and he was preaching faith and he was faithful to the commission until it showed up. Yeah. 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 Teach you faith. Yeah. Great faith comes through great blessings? No, through great trust and trials. The woman still teach you faith. They had to believe God for their daily bread. All right, let me get a good look at you because maybe half of you won't show up next week. <laughs> it's not the most exciting thing, but it will answer questions. Why people keep stumbling and stumbling and why things don't work even though they're called. It's because they quit, they give up. They're quick to give up on God and they talk bad about people. This is the way to promotion through the wilderness. You pass the test, then you enter in to God's best. So we'll start looking at those five things. You've done it. You've endured. Have you ever heard a message like this from anyone? No. No, you hear about all the blessings of heaven are mine. Yes, they are. God wants to get you, but let character, let patience have its perfect work. That you may be perfect and tired, wanting nothing. That's just as much in the Bible as all the blessings of heaven are yes and amen. All right. I preach myself happy. I need to get that out. Now you can see why I don't preach this very often. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to produce in series, and especially folks that are called. Or maybe not called ministry, but to do something great. This is your answer. You, you put your hand to the plow. You give all diligence when things don't work out as should. You just you keep trusting. You keep believing. You know, Joseph could have said, God, you failed me. I was faithful with Potiphar, and this is what I get in prison. To hell with you, God. He would have died in prison. People are dying in prison. People, they're dying in the wilderness. Because they don't understand some of these things were meant to test your heart. 
all right, that's enough. 